So welcome to Great Falls, Virginia. As you can see, we're in something rather special, but we'll get to that. First, let's geek out about something. Something I normally don't geek out about, and that is a gear selector. Not a transmission, a gear selector. It is on the steering column, as well as an old school Prindle right in front of you. But here's what's unique about it. It has all of the tactile feel of a switch, like a toggle switch from like an old Jaguar or even like a really nice light switch in your house. It takes almost no effort to switch the gears in your 6,000 pound convertible. So with that, let's press on. And while I do some driving, why don't you guys get reacquainted with Dave Kinney? Six point seven five liter V eight with a whopping two hundred and twenty horsepower. Now keep in mind this was nineteen eighty five. Those numbers are not surprise. Well, always the six point seven five is surprising, but the two hundred and twenty is not all that surprising for that era. This is the same block that you will find in the Mulzahn Speed that has almost 800 pounds of torque, something you would never find in a car of this era. And it is also the same basic block that you will find in Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars from the Cloud II era. So that's stretching from approximately early 1960s to today. That's a good long time. Uh, that's even longer than uh, Moto Man has lived, I believe. I'm not sure. Anyhow, uh, this car has fuel injection. It's early fuel injection for a car like this. Earlier versions of this came uh, carbureted. This is a 30-year-old car, so you're going to have problems with those rubber bits that are finally reaching the end of their age. That's something that we've constantly done on this car, myself and my mechanic, obviously. And also, uh, we've recently had some air conditioning work. Air conditioning from this era is a little bit better than a mouse breathing over an ice cube, uh, but you're never really going to get yourself frozen out of uh, one of these cars uh, unless you're already driving in freezing weather. So Dave, well, as you can tell, he's a bit of a comedian, and he loves to remind me that the output here is adequate. So with that in mind, let's you and I take it easy when it comes to pushing power because there was no all-wheel drive in Bentley back in the day of 1985. So let's go over this beautiful wood bridge, put our foot into it. And you know what? It's entirely adequate. It doesn't have a lot of horsepower as Dave told you, but the torque, forget about whatever number it is, even back in 1985, this could pull tree stumps because remember this is a six thousand pound car so it needed to have torque to get this thing moving like for example a beautiful steep hill in northern virginia stunning place where it falls <laughs> and there is just no sweat but at the end of the day do we really need to be pedantic on whether this car goes quickly not really because this is not about going quickly this is all about the journey. You know the old joke that they have about how you know your uh, British car is out of fluids? It means that there's no liquid leaking out of it. So uh, that's not usually the case with the hydraulic fluid, although that has happened before. Uh, with this era of cars. These cars run hydraulic suspensions. Hydraulic suspension is kind of a good news, bad news thing. They're a really nice ride when they're working. They give you a really comfortable ride. When they're not working, can be very expensive to fix. Maybe even $10,000 or more on this era of car. And these Rolls and Bentley cars from this era had that suspension. So you want to make sure you've got a good suspension. You can test it. You can sit in the trunk of the car by yourself and start the car and, and have it lift up. Uh, your weight means nothing against the 6,000 total pounds that this car has, and that's exactly what this car has. It's a 6,000 pound car. So check for hydraulics, look for leaks, look for things that don't look right in terms of the way the car sits. That's how you know it's good. So um, driving dynamics, mm, I think not. What we really need to unpack here is what were the contemporaries of this vehicle back in 1985, 
And it was unusual if you really think about it. This was a car that was designed in the mid 60s, came out in the late 60s. Its only absolute direct competitor came from the very same car manufacturer, and it was the exact same car, just with a different grille, different speedometer, and different wheels. But let's look across the English Channel. There were competitors from Germany, but it too was designed in the late 60s, introduced in the early 70s, so it was long and tooth, also in 85. Then let's go back over to England. It's sort of competitor from the Midlands, that was also designed in the late 60s, was originally introduced in the early 70s, the XJS. So in 85, you could have anything you want as long as it was state-of-the-art driving dynamics technology for 1967. The only sort of competitor that was modern, there were two of them. One of them didn't have a convertible option. It was the Mercedes-Benz SEC, so the Coupe S-Class, and that was brand new as of the early 80s, and that was like a spaceship to me. Back then, I didn't have a driver's license, so I didn't even know what this thing was. The SEC, my God, the numbers were off the charts, it looked cool, and then there was an AMG, there was a Lawrencer version, but then if you really wanted performance, you literally had to go to the cheap seats of, heaven forbid, Detroit, and not even get a Cadillac, you had to get a Corvette, Back then, that was the most modern convertible that had a V8 that sort of competed with this. So at the time, the competitive landscape, the bar wasn't very high, so there wasn't a lot of competition that Rolls-Royce and Bentley were really fussed about. But it still falls under the heading of, you can't sell a young man an old man's car, but you can sell an old man a young man's car. That's why I think they only sold 401 of these, as opposed to God knows how many SLs that were then updated at that point with a much more modern engine, or the Corvettes that were selling in more volume. Even the XJSs were updated with a different engine and a convertible that looked kinda cool. So that left this as the gentleman scholar of the day, and as a result, wasn't the finest in terms of driving dynamics. But frankly, I got a turn here. I'm gonna go around it really slow, but I just, I don't care. Okay, so it's a Bentley. So let's look at the interior because Bentleys are all about the interior. Even from this age, you can see it's a luxurious interior all the way through. When I got this car, it was chocolate brown. Uh, we changed it to put tan leather interior in, but we did keep the original chocolate brown on the dash covering and also in the console. Now I did replace that dash covering because originally it was made of leather. Leather's great stuff, but it doesn't wear real well in the sun. And so uh, we've replaced it with vinyl that'll probably be here 30 years from now. Um, some of the other things to note in the interior are that's all real wood on these door caps and on the dash. Uh, and in that real wood, you'll see that there are three digital gauges in the center. Um, digital was kind of the new thing back in the 80s. Uh, they work mostly. Um, now, of course, everyone's gone back to analog, and analog is something you can even get on a Kia these days. Uh, one of the other things that I did with this car was I replaced the uh, steering wheel. That's a nardy wood wheel I put in. This is the original wheel that went in there. Um, so you can see we've kind of uh, taken it down maybe one inch in size. Uh, keeping the wood wheel, I mean, keeping the wood wheel in is a nice look, but I am going to save this leather wheel uh, in case somebody or myself wants to change it back at some day. It's a comfortable cruising car with uh, lots of, uh, you know, creature comforts going for it uh, that you'd expect to find in a uh, modern car and a few things that you wouldn't expect. Probably that number one thing you wouldn't expect is uh, this car actually has two bars in it. Uh, not just one in the passenger door, which I'll show you, but a matching one in the driver's door. Now, probably not approved by all, but all you do is turn the key, and right down here, you can reach right in, and there are room for four glasses and a flask. This is not the original flask that came with the car, uh, but as a tribute to the Bay City Rollers, we just decided to use this one. Now, this is the point of the episode where I'd normally say, Let's dial back a little bit, slow down, and unpack a couple of notes. 
uh, we're just going to stay at the same speed if that's all right with you. Uh, there are a number of things to talk about. Number one, the view. It's, it's stunning. You have sort of like modern day for the late 60s pontoon fenders. So when you're looking down the hood, you're kind of aiming this thing almost. Remember when we drove the Aero Super Sports way back in the day? The hood ain't that long, but it's the same feeling. Now a little bit about my own personal experience with this specific car. Dave was very kind to let me drive this thing when he first got it. It wasn't as well sorted out as it is today in terms of aesthetics, but in terms of the driving experience, it's very similar. He's updated a little bit, but it's very, very similar. And this, it kind of takes me back and makes me think. If I go and drive this in 1985, it wouldn't, it really wouldn't be that spectacular of experience back then because it was really just a big V8 with rear drive in a very heavy car. But here's what time does. It takes this car and all of a sudden there's nothing out there like this today. Cars that were made like this in the 60s and you didn't have to buy a super expensive car to have this experience. You could have bought this kind of experience in a Buick, granted not as fancy, but you would have had the same big full-size convertible V8 rear wheel drive. Now you don't have that. Now everything is unibody and feels a different way, which over what, 32 years, this is now an incredibly special driving experience. So much so that I would go so far as to saying that this is a more special driving experience today than its contemporaries from back in the day if you were to drive them in 2017. And here's why. If you were to drive an SL, drive the XJS, they are closer to the design and construction and engineering of a modern day car. But this is an entirely different experience driving it in today's day and age, but it's still very usable in today's day and age. Like, I do have to say something that's a pet peeve of mine. You know, when you go to those fancy car auctions at like Pebble Beach or Amelia Island or over in Europe, you know, the auctioneer always says that incredibly annoying, stupid rich guy line of, ah, it's great to take the kids out for ice cream. You could take the kids out for ice cream. Me, I would never let any child in the car, number one, or number two, let them eat in it, and number three, a dairy product. But this is so much more than taking it out for ice cream. This, like, everywhere you drive, it's like parting the Red Seas. Like, people look at this thing, and they are just amazed by it, but in an incredibly positive way. And for example, I was coming out of Dave's house to drive this thing, going through a major intersection, stopped at a light. There was a guy all of like maybe 19 years old. He wasn't even born, wasn't even, his parents weren't even, had met each other when this car came out. He was like, dude, that is the coolest thing I have ever seen. And then last but not least, and you know me, the details. Of course, it's got the stitching on the A-pillar, leather-covered visors, book-match wood, don't love the clock. I will tell you, I'm not a big fan of the steering wheel Dave did here, the original one. It's ugly, but it's leather and it takes it back to the original day. And then, there's the trunk, man. Even the trunk is cool. Dave told me a fun fact. Uh, all Rolls-Royce and Bentleys up until when Volkswagen and BMW took over, they all had kill switches in the back. So yeah, they meant them because they knew that people wouldn't drive these things every day, so they would turn off the battery, you know, famous British electronics. But I would argue that they also were a theft deterrent device, because think about it, the kind of people that would steal these things were probably too stupid to figure out that the electrics were off. They just figured, ah, it's a British car, it's not even fool with it. But then, not just the carpeting, the actual trunklet itself, is finished in leather and there are these fine little screws that hold the cover in place. And with that, I think I need a little alone time with Dave's Bentley. So I'm gonna hand you back to him. Moto Man likes to tell you I'm the guy who writes the book. I am the guy who's the publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. This is something we've been doing for a long time now, something we enjoy because we are car guys. I'm a car guy as well. This is my car. This is my 85 Bentley uh, Continental Convertible. If it was a Rolls Royce, it would be called 
a Rolls-Royce Corniche convertible. They came down the same line at the same time. Really the only differences were things like hubcaps, that little speedometer thing is gonna have a B in it, a flying B instead of the RR, a few other trim pieces on the car, and of course, the grill in the front. It's a Bentley grill instead of a Rolls-Royce grill. Now, uh, for valuations purposes, these were a lot fewer built than the Rolls-Royce. Under 500 of these in all series, and that's going from the 1960s well into the 1990s. That's a long period of time. Whereas the Rolls-Royce Corniche did thousands of cars. Even though it's not a big number, it's still a lot more than the, uh, than the Rolls-Royce. Now, what happened in the history of Bentley and Rolls-Royce? The two companies split up. Bentley has become a more powerful brand in the last 20 years. Rock stars, guys on Wall Street, no real difference. They all decided that Bentley was the brand to have. That started in the 1980s and in the late 1980s when Bentley introduced the Turbo R, a car that kind of changed their things around for them. Uh, this car preceded that as an 85. And like I said, kind of old school production all the way through. This thing was pretty much hand built all the way, different assembly line than the ones that they built the standard Rolls Royces on, the standard Bentleys on. Now, what's happened in the past few years is the Bentley version of this has become more valuable. One of the reasons why is because they made less. Another reason why is because the Bentley is perceived a little bit more friendlier than the Rolls Royce by the public. Uh, you get a lot of smiles, you get a lot of, you know, uh, handheld hand uh, uh, devices taking photos of your car. You don't get a single digit held up of you quite as many times as you do when you're in the Rolls Royce version of this. I know this, I've done it before. Uh, so this car right now as it sits is a driver quality car. I'd counted it at about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. I'm not selling it so it really doesn't matter. Um, if it was incredibly nice it could be a hundred thousand dollar car. Now in terms of trending will this car be a hundred thousand dollar car someday? Yes I think it will. That's not the reason I bought this car. I bought this car to enjoy it. It's a great convertible. It's a great cruiser. It will also uh, keep you happy all those times that it's not keeping you broke. Now I know that Moto Man loves to tell you that I'm the guy who writes the book, but there's more to it than that. I'm also a guy who has a question for you right now, just like Moto Man wants me to ask. That question is, in this particular case, the Bentley was cheaper than the Rolls Royce when it was new. Only a couple thousand bucks, but it made a difference. Why was the Bentley cheaper when it was substantially the same car as the Rolls Royce? You can contact us on social, go to the comments below, or you can find me on Twitter at DHKinney. Moto Man wants me to leave you with a fun fact. And we all know Moto Man has his rules, so I can't not leave you with a fun fact. When I bought this car, you know, I had a list of things I wanted to get done. I took it to the shop. I said, hey, here's a list. One of the things I wanted to have done was the bumpers, front and rear, they're these rubber bumpers. They were body colored. Now keep in mind, this is an 85. So that was the era when they did kind of the dipped look, the monochromatic uh, look on the car. Anyhow, I took it in, I said, paint the bumpers. They call two weeks later, they say, hey, we never got to the word from you whether you wanted them painted body color or whether you wanted them painted the matte black that they were the couple years before and all the years after. I said, what's the difference? They said, 450 bucks for matte black, 1250 for body color. I said, hey, there's no choice there. Make them matte black. They said, perfect, your car's ready. It had been painted about a week ago. I wanted to also leave you with one thing. Moto Man always says something stupid in German that nobody understands. I'm going to say something intelligent in English that everybody understands. Rule Britannia. <laughs>